I struggled a bit with the title for this talk, so I thought, you know, why don't I start where we left off last year, TBS 2018. How cool was this? Remember that? The tactical airway opening maneuver. <laughs> I just thought this was the coolest thing in the whole world. And I was like, I'm going to go home and back to my air ambulance service in the southeast of England. And I'm going to, you know, try and do some more new stuff, some cool stuff. So what I thought I'd do for the next 25 minutes or so is just summarize how I personally, in particular our service, has changed our pre-hospital practice in the last 12 months and highlight some of the key areas on pre-hospital resuscitation and pre-hospital uh, trauma management. And since I last saw you, we've got this, whoops, it's gone. Can you resurrect the slide? Perfect, thanks. Got this super fancy new helicopter, and one of the reasons we've got this is we can actually do RSI in the back of the aircraft. Now, we've done this a few times on land. We've not yet done it in the air, but we have an SOP written. And I'm hopeful maybe next year to give you some data about what it's like to actually do your anesthetic whilst moving in the air. Now, for the next little while, we're going to focus on a key case, one case from my service. I want you to watch this video very carefully and think very carefully about how you as an individual are going to respond to this case. Okay, so here we go. It's a town near where you live. Oof. If you missed it, it's coming again. Okay, here's our patient lying on the floor. We very rarely get to see this. Okay, it's captured on CCTV. You arrive on scene, here's your patient. Okay, very classic. Blunt trauma. Blunt neurotrauma. He's got a head injury. One of the first things that happens is your ambulance crew very helpfully attach a monitor and up flashes some normal basic physiology. So look at the physiology. He's tachycardic, he's breathing fast, his first blood pressure reads 70 over 40. I'm not going to make you put up your hands. Who's going to give this patient a blood transfusion? Whole blood maybe after yesterday. Oh look, straight up at the back. He's getting whole blood. Brilliant. Love it, okay, love it. Whole blood, maybe a bit of uh, fluid of some description. But here's the thing. This really changed my practice. This paper, actually from our service, published in Injury last year, that shows that patients who just have a brain injury can have profound abnormalities in their cardiovascular physiology. Actually, only about half of isolated TBI patients will have normal cardiovascular physiology. So if we look at this one and break it down a bit, you see there on the right, in 9% of patients who just have a TBI, nothing else wrong with them, they are not bleeding, they will have a pre-hospital heart rate of more than 100 and a systolic of less than 100 in almost 10% of the time. Now that's a bit of a, pardon the pun, a head fuck, isn't it? Okay? Most of you would have sat there saying that patient's bleeding and would have bet a lot of money and would have gone down that track. But actually, a big proportion of head injuries are vasoactive. Vasoactive traumatic brain injury is something I've learned about. Okay, so say you decide, you know what, the numbers are pretty bad, I am going to give this patient something. Now, we touched on this, page, this paper yesterday, but I think it's worth a quick revisit. The PAMPA trial took patients with exactly this physiology, so blood pressure less than 90, heart rate more than 100, and randomized them to either have normal care, just whatever they normally had, or they got additional two units of pre-hospital plasma. And they used just normal plasma uh, at, a, at a cool box. Now what they showed was pretty striking. With the addition of two units of plasma to your pre-hospital resuscitation strategy, there was a 10% reduction in your 30-day mortality. Now Charles showed the little diamonds yesterday, okay, the plot showing that 
plasma was significantly better than just standard care involving crystalloid. Now this is by no means the end of the story and it's not the end of the story because if you look at some of the subgroup analysis, the two ones that struck out to me, patients did better when you gave them plasma when they just had a traumatic brain injury. What's going on there? Well, we don't really know, but there's actually quite good animal evidence to suggest that the plasma is quite good at reducing ICP. Probably better than things like mannitol and that kind of stuff in the pre-hospital setting. And even patients that aren't needing, you know, the full-on transfusion, and we've had this experience, just by loading them up with some early plasma allows them to clot, allows them to um, achieve that hemostasis that you're, you're trying to achieve. And in our service, we've certainly had some really good impact from lyophilized plasma. So it's a long half li a long storage life. You don't need to cool it. Very practical for use in the pre-hospital setting. So back to our patient who's been hit by the car. You've got your numbers. Let's say he's got a GCS of five. Make it really easy, shall we? Who wants to RSI this guy? A few hands just itching, you know, got to get the RSI. Okay, fine. And there's good evidence, isn't there, to RSI, a traumatic brain injury. I love this slide. I always think if Carlsberg did pre-hospital RSI, it would look like this, wouldn't it? Why do we want to RSI our patient? We'd like to RSI our patient because it allows us to do all these standard things like give them lots of oxygen and control their end tidal, all the stuff you know. And this is lifted straight off our SOP in our service. This is why we do RSI for neurotrauma. Okay, so here's the next thing. One of the biggest meta-analyses of oxygen therapy versus normal therapy. So controlled oxygen versus liberal oxygen. Published last year, and I would urge you to read it. A huge number of patients over 25 trials. What was the headline? The headline was that when liberal oxygen was used, mortality was significantly worse. Conservative, controlled oxygen in any acute patient is much better than flooding them with oxygen. Again, we don't have time to go into reactive oxygen species and all this complex stuff, but the evidence is pretty strong that in-hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, long-term mortality was all better when you controlled your oxygen. And if you translate the statistics, this is a number needed to harm of about 71. It's quite striking. Think about your service. You probably have one of these. How many of these can you just ventilate someone on air? Probably not many. And actually, it's very difficult. We tend to just give our trauma patients 100% oxygen for quite a long time, and they might not need it. And if you don't have a ventilator, I'm sure many of you in the audience are sitting there saying, well, I don't have a ventilator, I just use these two. Maybe it's worth thinking about how we can control the oxygen we're giving. So having a targeted algorithm. So yeah, sure, you're aiming for 96, 98%. But if you're achieving that, maybe then aim to start taking it down a notch and targeting your oxygen a bit better. So back to our SOP. My SOP says, in traumatic brain injury for this patient, we should aim for a systolic blood pressure more than 90. I'm sure most of you will do the same. Aim for radial pulse. Yeah, seems like a sensible solution. And I think Tim might have showed this a few days ago. This is the outcome from traumatic brain injury when compared to your lowest systolic blood pressure. And what do you notice? Well, there's no inflection point at 90. It doesn't suddenly get better. It's linear. In traumatic brain injury, in isolated traumatic brain injury, the higher your blood pressure pre-hospital, the better your outcome. So we should be striving for higher blood pressures than 90. We should probably be striving for as high as we can get. 
Okay, so again, something to think about. Now let's think about our patient. If the patient was the girl on the right, left, le right, left, is it going to make a difference? Are you going to treat the 25-year-old hot fitness instructor the same as your 92-year-old granny if she gets knocked over? A lot of you are sitting there thinking, I'd never RSI that one, but I'd RSI this one. So I shouldn't be ageist, and I shouldn't be sexist. What, let's take, make it a boy. This guy, he's pretty good at crashing cars. Okay. <laughs> My colleagues from uh, east of England, with some of them here, imagine you got called to this guy. He crashed his car. He's GCS4. He's 92. Are you going to RSI him? <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn will. Because a brilliant story on the news. <laughs> Get knighted if you did. But actually, where's the evidence? We're all internally quite resistant to RSIing the 92-year-old, aren't we? Because we know the neurosurgeons are never going to take them to theatre. We think we know the outcome. Well, if you look at this study published last year, a, a single centre, but pretty large, so 1,300 patients over the age of 65, and almost half had a TBI. And most of those they got from just standing from falling height. And of course, some of them are on you know, anticoagulants and things. And about a third had neurosurgery. Okay, so pretty sporting. I would never persuade my neurosurgeons to intervene this often. Reasonable amount of intervention. But this was really striking. 78% survived their TBI and nearly 60% went home, not just to a nursing home, but with a good Glasgow outcome score. So that means they went home to independent living, home to their families. So maybe we shouldn't be quite as ageist as we think. Actually, the patients in this age group with TBIs can and do do very well if they have early neurosurgery. So let's change track just a little bit. Medical cardiac arrest, the bread and butter of pre-hospital medical care. All of you will be involved in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We've had great uh, talks about it throughout the conference. But that one ongoing dilemma, to intubate or not to intubate. Just look at this conference. How many gadgets and gizmos and cameras and every cool little thing have we got to get an endotracheal tube into our patient's airway? And in cardiac arrest, the tube is the gold standard, isn't it? You know, it's the Batman intervention. It secures the airway, it prevents aspiration, 100% oxygenation, and we arrive wielding our laryngoscope. We're all like that. And the superglottic's just kind of second best, isn't it? It's like, you know, the sidekick, right? It doesn't really save the day, just helps the bigger guy. And we're not, yeah, we don't arrive wielding our eye gel. It's just not as cool, is it? So actually, in 2018, we had what we needed, a head-to-head, -head, a Batman versus Robin, okay? A very clear, very elegant performed study in the UK, Airways 2, it was a cluster randomized trial across five UK ambulance services, and they randomized medical cardiac arrest to a strategy that was either intubation first or supraglottic first, and a nice big number of patients, the biggest number of patients ever to be recruited to a trial like this. So what do you think the outcome was? Hey-ho, no difference, okay? No difference in modified ranking scale, so again, Discharge alive with good neurological function, no difference whatsoever between your endotracheal intubation or your supraglottic airway. But here's the thing. Let's just have a look and all the usual health warnings about subgroup analysis. But when you went head to head, ventilation was achieved faster and in more cases in the supraglottic group than it was in the intubation group. Regurgitation, the big one. There was no difference whatsoever in the incidence of aspiration, regurgitation in either group. 
Eye gels were no worse at protecting your lungs from aspiration than the tube was. If you looked at ROSC, actually, there was a slightly higher incidence of ROSC in the supraglottic device. And that may be because, of course, for the supraglottic, you're just off the, you know, you're on the chest more, there's less distraction, it's easier to do. And as we've heard yesterday, the CPR and the defibrillation are more likely to be formed to a higher quality. And that probably is summarized in this slide here. I know it's a, it's a bit busy, but what it essentially shows is some patients were randomized to get intubation. And for whatever reason, that actually ended up getting supraglottic first and then intubation later for you know, whatever situational reasons. And if you look at the different subgroups down here, the highest survival was in exactly that group the group that got an early supraglottic, good resuscitation, and intubation later down the line. And actually, I've probably changed my practice as a result of this. I would probably intubate the patient after ROSC. Pre-ROSC, nice strong evidence to suggest that using the supraglottic is just as good. It allows good resuscitation. And then, of course, at some point, we're going to have to intubate them. Because if they end up in intensive care, clearly they will end up intubated. But actually, the decision on timing, I think we can push the intubation to the right a little bit. Penetrating trauma, a biggie. Stabbing, shooting. My colleagues in London tell me almost one in two of their missions now, unfortunately, is for stabbings. Ours is on the increase. I'm sure a lot of you in your services have worsening penetrating trauma rates. So what's new in penetrating trauma? Probably not a lot. You all know that scene time is everything. Pre-hospital scene time needs to be really, really short. Now, this isn't new, but the number of patients in it is. This is a big retrospective analysis of penetrating trauma patients and looking at that outcome by how they got to hospital. Did they get chucked in a car and driven there or did they wait until EMS arrived and put them in an ambulance and then carted them off to hospital? And what you see is a very, very strong sign that actually the private transport ones did a lot better. Now, we could think of all sorts of interesting reasons why, but this is a real case from the UK that really got me thinking. In the UK, when someone's stabbed or shot, the first person to arrive is usually one of these badass guys. Now, these guys are pretty cool. They're calm under pressure. A lot of them have got military training. They've all got pretty advanced medical training. They can put a tourniquet on, they carry hemostatic agents, and they regularly deal with this kind of stuff. And we had a case in the UK not so long ago where a patient had been stabbed. The armed police had secured the scene. They said, we need an ambulance. An ambulance is coming. It's just coming. It's got to get through the cordon. It's got to find the scene police officer quite correctly recognized the patient was deteriorating in front of him. The ambulance arrived. It was an ambulance car, as we often send in the UK. Oh, sorry, don't worry, the ambulance is coming. Two minutes, three minutes, another car arrives. And somewhere this sort of lost in translation, that we need an ambulance, not an ambulance car. In the 20 to 25 so minutes, the patient continued to deteriorate. This patient was about a seven-minute drive from a major trauma center. And actually, the police officer could have put the patient in the back of his Land Rover. OK, he might have made a bit of a mess of the seat, but hey-ho. Spoken to the MTC and said, I'm coming in. He's got a tourniquet on. I'll be there in seven minutes. Because I challenge you, actually, you think by the time the ambulance gets there and assesses the patient and does all the stuff we normally like to do, we're not going to compete with seven minutes, aren't we? Should we just be encouraging these guys to just put them in the car and just go to hospital? Maybe think about that for your service. And could they have a link to your hospital where we could discuss this in real time with the trauma team leader? So just to wrap up then, what else did I learn in 2018? 
I learned probably one of the most valuable lessons I've learned in my pre-hospital career. The picture here was taken about two minutes before I completely fuck up this intubation. I've done loads of these and I look down I can't see anything. I max out, it's all going a bit wrong. And actually the paramedic on the right is the guy that bailed me out and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he calms me down and it all ends fine. And this quote I think is probably true to all of you here. The road to self-insight runs through others. When you're stressed, when you're maxed out, of course you lose the ability to start self-critiquing. Paramedics, doctors, nurses see you at your most stressed in the pre-hospital environment. They can tell you how you perform under pressure. They're the ones that are going to tell you how you can get better, how you can do a better job next time. So I'd encourage you all to think about that. How can you in your service maximize the self-reflection by asking others around you how you performed? Now, no other means is as powerful as watching yourself on video. There's different ways we can sort of take command at scene. Here's, a, here's an example. No, just leave the head blocked, sorry. Just leave the head blocked. Okay, okay, everybody, listen up, okay. I appreciate all your suggestions, okay, but we need one person in control, and it's going to be myself. <laughs> awesome, isn't it? There's going to be one person in charge, and it's me. <laughs> all right, now, Al had very good reasons for doing that, all right? But how do we reflect on it? Well, we regularly now use a body cam, a secure body cam to look at footage, sit after a mission, and review yourself. How did you speak to the paramedic? Did you look them in the eye? How did you speak to the patient? How did you come on the scene? Huge amount of information to be gained through video. And we're taking this one step further. Because, of course, at the moment, when we get a 112 or a 999 call, we're reliant on that bystander going right back to our first case at the beginning is he conscious? Is he breathing? These are very difficult questions for a bystander to answer. What happens if we could just see the patient? It's not that difficult. You all have video phones. You're sitting with them now. Why don't you just send a video to the ambulance control room? This is exactly what we're doing using the, the Good Sam platform. So all we do is we send the caller a text message. They don't need an app. They don't need any software. Do they accept the te text message? Yep. Yeah. They hit the button, instantly start streaming the video to our control room. Now, not only that, the technology is actually the beta version is so good that we can look and detect the patient's pulse rate down the video. All right. So as you're blood is going around your face, the small amount of pixelation, the software can pick that up. How handy would that be, our guy that's been hit by the car right at the beginning, if we can just film him within 30 seconds, get his oxygen level, get his pulse rate, tell the bystander to open his airway. So hopefully next year I'll be able to give you some information on how this is going. We've just submitted a paper, we're about to submit a paper shortly for publication on this, but it's very exciting technology. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, what did I learn in 2018? Hopefully you now know what a vasoactive head injury is. Plasma pre-hospital, I think, is really useful and we should look at it. For your cardiac arrest patients, think about delaying your intubation until after ROSC. And when you do, control your oxygen. Don't give them too much, titrate it. In your TBI patient, you need to aim for as high a map as possible. Don't be sexist. Don't be ageist. Treat everyone the same. Old people do well. And maybe after this conference, having heard all these awesome talks and met new friends and thought, hmm, what do other people do in their services? Just have a think about what you might do in 2019 to make yourself a bit better. Thanks very much for listening.